Well, today I get to meet with Juan Cotto, and uh, he and I got to meet each other a few years back at a Seahawks Academy, and, and uh, we ended up sitting near each other that weekend and, and really hit it off. Um, and we stayed in contact for a while, and then as life has it, <clears throat> you know, we kind of went our separate ways and we lost contact. Um, but I was talking to a mutual friend uh, this week, Bruce Brown, and uh, he mentioned you. I was like, oh my goodness, I need to reconnect with Juan. And, and uh, so that's what I've done. Juan is um, a former head football coach at Highline, Highline, correct? Highline High School. Yeah, Highline High School. Uh, now, currently, he's a senior government affairs and community engagement specialist with Bloodworks Northwest. Uh, he's taken some time away from coaching, uh, spending a lot of time with his young kids, which is highly commendable. So uh, without anything further, Juan, um, I'm going to give you the floor. And what I'd like you to address first is um, your family background. Maybe you can talk about parents and grandparents if you think that's important. Uh, but but your your life and how race and maybe racism has played a role in that. Sure, I am uh, I am born right here in Seattle. I grew up on the Beacon Hill neighborhoods and uh, down towards the, the 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 Skyway area, down towards Rainier Beach High School. My my mother is a lifelong Seattleite. She was born uh, and uh, attended. Uh, she was born here in Seattle and attended Garfield High School. Graduated in the the mid 1950s and. For 30 years, she was a, a nurse's tech at the Veterans Administration Hospital up on Beacon Hill, the big building everybody probably sees from the freeway. My father was from Cagos, Puerto Rico, and he uh, joined the Air Force Was it was a kid. You know, he, he told us at 18 years old, didn't really know what he wanted to do, and he decided to join the Air Force and got to see a, a lot of part of the world. He got stationed at Tuskegee, Alabama. Um, and became a mechanic, and uh, like, like many of our, our dads who grew up in that area era, my father could fix anything. It was absolutely amazing, his, his, his skill set with tools and things that he taught us. He, um, he ended up being stationed at uh, McCord Air Force Base, and uh, my uncle uh, introduced him to my, my mom, and uh, the rest is history. So they, they grew up here in Seattle. Interesting story, Dan. Um, my mother and father had uh, three children before me, and unfortunately, in a, in a fire in 1964, about four months before I was born, um, my mother and father, uh, my, my mother was working at, at uh, the hospital downtown Seattle, and um, they were actually up on, up on Beacon Hill, and um, the house got on fire, unfortunately, with an accident, and my, my father was able to escape, and my mother and father lost their three children. Mm. So that was, that, uh, that was really the, the, the dynamic that I was, that I was born into. Um, my, and so uh, th through uh, unbelievable tragedy and, and the, the resolve of two incredibly strong people, uh, my mother and father um, had me and then they had uh, two more children. So I, I grew up with two brothers. And, um, you know, my, my mother and father were two, fun or they, my, my father passed away in 1995. My mother is still alive and lives down in the Federal Way area. But uh, two phenomenal people. They, they went to work every single day to provide for their kids. They had a tremendous work ethic. My mother um, felt that she, uh, she grew up in the central area of Seattle, and she wanted us to go to Catholic school. She just felt it was a better educational system for us. And uh, she, she worked uh, tirelessly to send us. I attended St. Edwards Elementary School down in the kind of the Columbia City neighborhood of Seattle, uh, St. Paul's down in the south end of Seattle, and then uh, O'Day High School. Uh, and uh, my mother has a, an interesting thing. She had three sons that went to three that went to three different high schools. My brother Andy, uh, he uh, he finagled his way out of O'Day and finished his academic career at Rainier Beach. And then my youngest brother, he went out to West Seattle, uh, and he, he was bussed out there. And he really enjoyed the the, the public school environment. So, um, but uh, but nevertheless, um, you know, we we all the, the three of us kind of developed their work ethic. Um, I, I went on, and I, I had a I had a you know a really decent academic and athletic experience at O'Day. Um, was more of a baseball player, and I uh, ended up getting a, a, a scholarship to Western Oregon State College, which is down in the heart of the Willamette Valley. And uh, I always I say I, I was born and raised in Seattle, but I grew up down in Monmouth, and uh, just really had a wonderful experience down there. And uh, I had a, had an, an excellent uh, academic experience, and I uh, was elected student body president and uh, of the of the school down there. And I had always had that social that social impact and political bent, and uh, just you know, still have a lot of remarkable friends down in the Willamette Valley, and some of them become extremely high uh, extremely successful high school football coaches, Dan. Uh, down there, Sean McNabb, who was the, is the longtime coach at Scapoose High School, and, and a number of others have just done phenomenal jobs in their coaching careers. And, um, and then I, I ended up uh, working a couple years in Major League Baseball uh, for the Atlanta Braves and the Seattle Mariners, uh, which were really exciting opportunities and, uh, and had, such a, had such a great time at that. Went back to graduate school at the University of Washington. 
um, got involved in politics and worked on several major political campaigns for from some local candidates. Uh, we I helped. I uh, was on the campaign team with Patty Murray, and I uh, helped her get elected a long time ago when she for, was running for the United States Senate. Um, worked for Gary Locke. Uh, who ultimately became King County Executive and Governor, and then he went on to a career in uh, his, his, his Commerce Secretary and then the U.S. Ambassador to China. And then, um, you know, it was time for me to, uh, to to do some different things. So I got out of the political realm, um, and then I, I worked at a small Catholic school up on uh, up in Capitol Hill, St. Joseph School. I was the Director of Development and uh, raised about five and a half million million dollars in four years and, and really learned the, the, the business of the, the, uh, the administrative side of, of, of education. And then um, a, an opportunity presented itself at Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center. They were looking for somebody to do community outreach. And uh, I was invited to, to I, I had put a plan together for them. And they basically asked me to come in and, and help execute the plan that I had written for them. And, and we were engaging minority and underrepresented communities in cancer research. And then um, the opportunity presented itself at Bloodworks, where now I'm in a similar role. Um, they've expanded it in terms of my, my outreach uh, to elected officials in the area and, uh, and lobbying the state government for ways that we can support blood research. But um, I, I'm currently doing the government affairs work. And then on top of all of that, uh, Dan, as you know, for, for, for 13 wonderful years, um, you know, I started as an assistant coach at Nathan Hale High School and worked under uh, a, a guy who's become a local legend here in the area, Hoover Hopkins, who does a fantastic job of taking, he took Cleveland High School and built a really solid program there in the, in the early 90s and into the early part of the decade. And then he did the same thing at Nathan Hale. And we had tremendous success at first three years of, of, uh, of coaching it on his staff at, at Hale. And then in um, 2007, um, I was named, or sorry, 2008, February 2008, I was named head football coach at Highline High School. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, I had, I had read a book back in 2002, my, my, my girlfriend, now wife, we read uh, Barnes & Noble, and I read uh, When the Game Stands Small about De La Salle High School. And then I read about Bob Latasseur and, and the way they approach coaching high school football. And, I, and uh, my, 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 my girlfriend, wife, now, she was like, I, I, well, you know, I, I don't, she doesn't, she doesn't, she came from a political background and she didn't, she didn't want me to go into politics. And I said, well, I think I figure out what I'm going to do next. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and lo and behold, I think about uh, three years into the, the high school football coaching career, she was kind of like, boy, politics is almost better than this. <laughs> go back to politics. But uh, it, it was a, it was a wonderful experience working with Hoover. I really learned about how to build a program, uh, how to build it from from your heart, how to build it with your spirit, and uh, we took the same thing down to a uh, Highline and had a had a wonderful five year experience down there. Um, and then just so people will know, and so I can be transparent and maybe lead to some some conversations this morning. My wife and I experienced a, a tragedy of losing our, our son. We, we had a, a, our second son, um, Salvador Miguel. He was killed in a tragic accident in in uh, Richmond, Virginia. And um, I flew across the country, got off the airplane, and they, they told me the, you know, the, the words that no parent wants to hear, your, your, your child is dead. So we had to um, really overcome some things um, uh, during that particular period back in June of 2011. And um, you know, just with, uh, with, we, we, we found, I think, tremendous resolve in our faith and our strength in each other, um, and uh, you know, made, made a commitment to each other that we we're going to keep our relationship together. Um, and, and not only not let this separate us, but as we were going to bond it, and uh, we were going to have this, this situation bond us and, and make a, a, an, an incredible uh, situation for our son and you know, make sure that he knows that his mother and father are together and we're going to fight through this. And, and we've taken it one day at a time for the last nine years. And uh, then in um, 2013, in March 2013, on my birthday, on my, uh, my, birthday um, my, my daughter Araceli was born. And, um, and that when, I, when I found out that, that uh, Sarah was pregnant with Araceli, I, I decided to take some time off of coaching and, uh, and, and uh, step down from the head coaching job at, um, at Highline. And then, um, it, Dan, I, I was approached um, about a year later in, in, in the early part of 2014, uh, Franklin High School, they had, uh, they had their, their coaching situation um, had changed and, they, and I, they asked me to apply for that position and I did. And then I was there as a head coach for, for, a, uh, for nine months mm -hmm. and it was a spectacular nine months and we really changed the culture and um, the, the, the principal uh, there, she decided that she wanted to move in a different direction. She felt that the, the, uh, the direction I was saying maybe a bit a little too strong for, for the students that were there and and, that, and and we've all experienced that I think in coaching you're gonna run up against that and then I went ahead and spent three more years with Hoover so um, so that's that's pretty much my story right um, so the the main gist of these conversations has been race and I definitely want to you know focus there but um, 
you know, a couple of things have come up in your story. Um, one, in your childhood, uh, the tragedy that, that fell on your family um, uh, with the fire, and then your own personal loss. And I, when I met you, that was still fairly fresh, uh, the loss that you'd experienced. Um, the, the importance of, as a, as a couple, pulling together when you can't understand. I mean, parents shouldn't have to bury children, right? But unfortunately, it happens. And um, so the importance of sticking together and then um, raising your children uh, and, and what you have experienced from your parents raising you, uh, I, I imagine there's a tendency early on, especially to maybe be overprotective or fearful or uh, those kind of things. Would you touch on uh, the approach that you've taken and, and how you um, want to raise your children in a healthy environment without maybe living in fear throughout that time? It's such a great question, Dan, and 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 I and I think that's so important. And my, my wife and I have talked about that, uh, you know. And uh, one of one of my uh, favorite movies of all time, and my son used to watch it all the time, was uh, Finding Nemo. Mm -hmm. And there, there's there if if you watch the movie, uh, there, there there are so many references to to almost almost a spiritual thing. But there's a, there's a scene in there where. Um, Dory is hanging on to the tongue and, and with, uh, with, with Marlin and he goes, how do you know everything's going to be okay if they drop down into the whale's belly and, 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 and ultimately the whale blows them out so they can go pursue Nemo. And she just looked him in the eye and she said, I don't. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that's one of the greatest expressions of faith. I mean, she, she, she didn't know, but she believed that what she had communicated with the whale was going to, was going to get them closer to where they were going. And I, and I think that that is a thing that, uh, one of the things that I've hung on to is the fact that, and I, and I told Sarah, you know, we have got to go ahead and, and, uh, and pursue our life in, in the, in the, in the manner, and we've got to depend upon our faith to pull us together. And it was one of the, the, and I was told my mom now, now I told my mom then, and I still tell her now I understand why you sent me to Catholic school. Uh, and the, the 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 component that we got out of it was certainly the component that I got out of it. When and and and, and you know, I've I've been on and off at the Catholic Church for years, and 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 certainly have uh, have a strong Christian background that's kind of tied into my my following Catholicism. And, and sometimes you have to eat the meat and spit out the bones uh, in 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 your own practice of religion. But the bottom line issue is that that our our faith was going to hold the answers of how we can go ahead and come back from this tragedy. And, um, and by, by no, by, uh, one of the things I also learned through that experience, Dan, and it helped in, in coaching sports is that the, the, the kids can see, kind of see right through you. Um, if you're asking them to do things and you're not making a commitment to it. Mm -hmm. And I, and I really felt that I had to double down on my commitment to, to really getting my life together and to getting my relationship together, uh, to getting my, my, my focus together, um, in my, my professional life and also in my spiritual life. And once I did that, I think that we were able to find ways um, and develop ways and, and that we were going to do that. But the, the most important thing is that Sarah and I are, are very, very close in our faith. And we, um, we were able to, to really make some commitments to each other and, and also sit down and think about how the, the type of family that we wanted to have and also the type of, of inspiration that we want to be with other people who are going through this circumstance. And we certainly have supported organizations that, that support parents of lost children. Um, we've reached out to a number of parents in the community after we've heard about their stories and just to let them know that they're not alone. And, and when you do that, you start to build the, the framework and the structure of, of, of living a life of significance. And that, that gets you to overcome the fear. And um, I think that we've been able to establish, you know, there, there were some times early on where, you know, we were afraid to let our, our children be with other people. And, you know, you, 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 do, you do hold on. But um, like, like Dory in The Whale, you have to learn to let go. And you have to let people, um, you have to let um, other people support you. And you have to have trust that uh, when your children make decisions as they're growing up and as people are around you offer to support you, you have to have faith that those things are going to work out. And that ultimately gets you over the fear. Thank you. Um, looking at your list of uh, places you've worked and accomplishments, uh, you know, working with, you know, governors and, and uh, senators and all the different people, um, You've clearly had, uh, you know, a lot of opportunities, uh, and you've you've jumped right in, and you've been involved. Um, have there been instances where you feel, because of race, you've had to work harder, or you've missed opportunities, or has that played a role for you? 
yeah, it's it's race is a a, a construct in our country that uh, it has been here since since obviously since the country started, um, and and really since the the you know especially in terms of the the breaking down of of slavery as an institution and trying to integrate people in society and. It's really, really interesting. And my, my background, my father was from Puerto Rico. He was a man of dark complexion. And uh, my mother is a black woman. So people hear my name and they, they, they assume you're automatically Latino. And, and certainly I am. I mean, my, I, I, there's, a, there's a Latino. My, my father's Puerto Rican. And certainly uh, the, 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 that Latino side comes through. And then also I'm, I'm, I'm an African-American man. Uh, you know, we, I was educated in a Catholic school environment and certainly, you know, we, we had our brushes with uh, certain aspects of racism and, and, and people saying things. My mother had a very, very clear philosophy. Was, uh, she was like, you know something, if someone says something to you, uh, you're just going to have to let that go. If, you're, if they put their hands on you and they say something, then, you know, I, I would expect you to go ahead and take appropriate action. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I won't, I won't uh, give you the, the verbiage that you use, <laughs> but... But um, you know, she 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 was real real clear that um, we we weren't going to have the this this attitude because someone says something to us, and, and um, so it was a little bit different in terms of how she how she viewed it for us. Um, th there were some times where I felt that um, the, the teachers were were unfair to me because I was black, and I had told her about that. And my mother, with with her philosophy, was let me tell you something. I'm paying this amount of money for tuition, so my expectation is that you're going to be able to get over that and learn and figure out how to do it. Hmm. And she was real, real clear that um, we, we were going to have to overcome those issues and that, that uh, you know, if the, if the teacher wasn't putting their hands on me, then I had to figure out how to use my mind to get myself to, to, to be able to, to, to get good grades in math, English, and writing. And, and she was real clear with that. And my, my mother was also a stickler for the English language and how we presented ourselves and how we spoke to people in the community. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and she, she was, was a, is a, is a real master of the English language and, and, uh, and, so we we knew very very well that you know how we were supposed to conduct ourselves. At the same time, I know that there are are folks who are, were brought up in, in in completely different educational uh, situations and also in, in completely different communities. And that's another thing. My my mother and father were both at home. They both worked. Uh, they they both had uh, they both had uh, eyes on us. And um, you know there were certain neighborhoods that we weren't allowed to go into, and they had real strict rules with us. And we we knew other kids in the community where that wasn't the case. Um, there, there, there were a lot of single parent mothers that we knew. There were, there were a lot of kids who um, were, were allowed to hang out in bad neighborhoods and get themselves in situation. So, I, you know, you, you know, you realize there's a difference. I'll say this, I, I will say this, and, and um, I'll be very direct. Um, in, my, in my educational uh, mindset, you know, I never, I never felt that I was inferior to my Caucasian counterparts. You know, I never felt that uh, it, the, the way we were educated and the way that um, we conducted ourselves, I, I just went on the, with, uh, and, and I always took the attitude that, you know, I can, I, I'm capable of doing a task and, and no one's going to outwork me. Um, these are the different types of things that I had learned through athletics. Uh, and I felt if I could be the, the, the starting center fielder on a baseball team, that I could ultimately be the, 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 the manager of an organization or group at a, at a, at a particular place. And, um, and my, men, my mentality was that no one was going to outwork me. I do know that, um, you know, that, that there, are, there are biases that do exist. Um, I, I, I worked real hard and, and I feel like I, I tried to, to, to work hard enough to, to, um, to, to overcome some of those biases. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard a lot over the years, Dan, oh, you're so articulate. Well, you know, I went to Catholic school for 12 years and I, I you know, have a college education. I should have command of English language. And uh, you know, and I, I've heard you know, you know, people have said certain things, and and uh, and and I, and I guess from probably what they may have seen on television, or or maybe some stereotypes have developed from people that they know that um, you know I, I'm somewhat different, but uh, you know I, I've never felt that was the case, and um, and, and I think that what 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 you represent and what your heart should be the thing that's led with, and I and I understand it's going to be misinterpreted by some people at times, um, and I and I understand that uh, that that may be a uh, you know, people may see that as kind of a, an, an over, you know, these, you know where, where did this guy come from or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. But, um, but the, the bottom line issue is that, you know, I've always worked to make a positive contribution. Um, I've always, and I, the other thing, Dan, too, is I've always tried to accept people with love. 
I, 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 you know, and that, and that's, that's really from developing a heart, uh, you know, and you, you really have to, and, and it's, you know, it, it takes a long time. You know, I, I allow people to, to make mistakes and, uh, and that I've, I've, my, my wife has really gotten me better at learning how to accept my own mistakes. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you really have, if you, if you approach it from a, if you, you approach it from a, um, an, an area of love, sometimes you can let some of those things go by. But I, but I, under, I understand. And having said that, I, I hope it doesn't sound um, like, like I'm trying to backtrack on what I've just said. There, there's, there's people who have had, who've experienced some serious hurt by some of those issues. And, and uh, you know, th th those hurts have definitely impacted who they are and their belief of who they are. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of our experiences. You know, one of our main roles as a coach is to get young people to see beyond themselves and to the potential that they have. And um, I think sometimes some of the some of the words people have said, some of the uh, some of the attitudes that have been deflected towards them, um, people hold on to those, and and the, and and, uh, and and those at times I think uh, are, are create a barrier. And and I think that that's that's some of the things that we have to help people overcome. Okay, so um, from that you just use the word barrier. Um, mm -hmm obstacle might be another word. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I kind of got this picture as you were talking about, uh, you know, people talk about white privilege and there's, you know, great videos out there that show maybe people starting further ahead in a race and those kind of things. And um, certainly there's a lot of reality to that. Um, but what I'm hearing from you is you can't let it be a brick wall that stops you. It needs to be an obstacle that you find some way to go around, go through, go under, right? Like, it's there, but you need to still overcome. And, you know, there's some people, uh, I've heard the phrase, well, somebody plays the race card or they throw this out or that and, and maybe race is the reason why they don't uh, achieve something. Um, where's the balance for fighting for equality, uh, but not making excuses and finding a way to still push through and, and find success? Well, I, I think it's, it's, it's really interesting because as, as, one of the things that I think that attracts young black males in particular, and, and, and cer certainly and, and certainly kids in general, but but young black males in particular to to sports, um, is the fact that you know if if I can run faster than you, if I can jump higher than you, if if I can defend, it's it's real easy to see, and and we we've seen it, and you know we've seen it in coaches. That kid can play. That kid can play. That kid can play, and um, I, I think sometimes where where the the in, the the biases come in. And the sense of privilege comes in is when when you have scientific papers at, at Fred Hutch, for example, and you have you know fifty five or sixty papers, you know how do you how, and and they're all written incredibly well and by intelligent people. How do you pick the one that is going to uh, be funded? Mm -hmm. And and you have to remember when when you when you look at the funding of of young scientists in their early parts of their career for their projects, that really determines who's going to stay in the scientific profession. And then, so some of those, some of those things come up and, and, if, and you, you look at it, um, it's, it is such a, a large percentage of, of young white people who are getting that funding. And, and it's a very, very small percentage of African-American and Latino scientists, for example, that, that are getting their projects funded. And, and, and they ended up, they end up leaving the, 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 the profession, which is, it's, and it's a very difficult profession anyways. Mm -hmm. But the, so the, 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 so yeah, the, 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 the bottom line is, you know, how can we, how can we create systems like we, we do in sports where the, the opportunity and, and the, the, the way that we, we judge opportunity is um, a little bit more clear, and it's and I, I've um, you know often the, you know, looked at and I and I and I really enjoy Pete Carroll's book, and mm -hmm. one of the books that I sent to you was Win Forever, mm -hmm. um, is developing that mindset that, of that transformational organization. You know how do we how do we uh, how, you know how do we create a, a world class environment that attracts world class talent, and how do we judge it, and and how do we allow people to be themselves? And I think that he's done a really good job of of creating that within the Seahawks headquarters. In the building, and, and I think you, I know you've been at the building. I've been at the building. We've seen it. What he's trying to create in there, and uh, and 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 it's been an incredibly diverse environment, not only with people on the field, which we see publicly, but also in the in the the administration in the front office. And I think they've done a really good job of of, of doing those things. And I think that th that's that's the question: is how do you create a an environment that that brings people and allows them to be their best, and that really takes into account some of the the biases that we all may have, and um, and it's and it's a real it's it's a real human issue.
issue. And I, and I think race is also a real human issue. I mean, we're, we are, we're, we're, we're more comfortable at times to be around people who are similar to us. Um, I always joke that, you know, I, I love guys that love to talk about sports and politics. And, uh, and, and I hang out with, you know, most of my friends, whether they are white or black or, or Asian or Latino, they, they love sports and politics. I mean, there's a, there's a common theme there. And, and the, the thing is, but, but the, the bottom line issue is, I, you know, from, from a real human perspective, we are going to um, attract people who are very, very similar to us. And the question becomes, how do we, how do we expand that in our culture? To, to allow for, for more people to be a part of that. And I think that's, that's the challenge that we have, certainly as, um, it, you know, as, as people who are leaders and looking at different ways to, to have this conversation around diversity and equity and inclusion. Okay, great. Um, what are some ideas that you have to move our country forward in the area of uh, you know, racial relations? Well, I tell you, I, I just, you know, um, for, first of all, I think we, 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 we have to address the fact that I, I think that besides what we have seen, besides what we have seen over the last several months, um, I, I think that we, we are, we've, we've come a long ways and we're, we're far closer. Um, the, the other, the other thing that I think it's, it's such a, it's a hard, uh, such a hard thing to articulate is that we're all not the same. And, and I, and I, I, I say that in love and I say that with, you know, you know, my, my experience is different than a lot of um, my African American brothers and that's, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. That, that is absolutely okay. And, and uh, I, I think that we have to um, acknowledge that the fact that there, there are differences, you know, I, I was very, very fortunate and I grew up with a family that, that two, had two working parents and I, I grew up with both, both my parents home and then the developed a work ethic and, and instilled that in us. Um, and I, and I think a, a lot of African Americans I know also grew up in the same sort of environment, but, um, the, 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 the question becomes, you know, how can we, we, we have to, admit, we have to, we have to listen and we have to admit uh, to, to, to everyone that there, there are challenges that, that people are having. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I love, I love Carol Dweck's book, uh, Mindset. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you know, how do we how do we develop that resilient mindset? And I think that it's that that's going to be a, a, a thing that we're going to have to really sit down and and think about is, you know, how do we how do we connect people in our country to to the to the to the good and to the the positive benefits that are in our country? And how do we you know, you, you can't guarantee it, but how do you you know, how do you create and, and how do we recreate at times? ways that that you know if you if you follow these these particular steps that you can be successful in the ways that you have defined in this country mm -hmm. and and uh you know dan i you look at you look at uh you know groups that come from uh the the newly arrived African groups, newly arrived Asian groups, and they come in and they, they set up restaurants and, and their work ethic from, that they've brought from their countries is completely different. And within several years, they've achieved an inordinate amount of, of financial and personal success. And we have to make sure that that is, is, a, is a guaranteed outcome for, um, or at least, at least, an, and, and we have to, we have to figure out a way that we can make that an outcome for, for people in our country. Um, I, I have been um, critical at times of the American education system. You know, I, I think that there, and, 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 you know, I know that you work in that and I, you know, certainly have coached in that, you know, I think that there's things that we need to do that we can, we can change education and make sure that people are getting, especially, especially in the inner city communities, mm -hmm. where, where um, at times the, the education can be drastically different and the results can be drastically different. And, and a lot of our kids are not, and when I say a lot of our kids, that's the African-American Latino population, the, the education gap still exists between those schools. And we, we really, really need to examine some of the reasons why, and we need to give parents the ability to give their kids a much more solid foundation. Mm -hmm. Then when, when, you, when you do that um, and, and get the education, then you, you know, I think that that there, there are opportunities and a mindset that gets created that a kid can achieve the, the, the opportunities that they set out to, to achieve for themselves. But, um, you know, there, there's some complex conversations that have to happen. Uh, I, and, uh, and I think we all need to be a part of those. And certainly as educators, we, we need to take a look at how those, those things impact the foundation that's being built for our children. And once we, once we examine that, I think that a lot of things can, can, can start to fall in line from, from the economics in communities. Um, all the way up to to the to the the different types of opportunities for 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 housing and and the different things along the line, but I, I think the the educational base has got to be um, addressed first. Yeah, and I think um, 
you know, I don't have all of the answers. A couple of things that, that just come to mind with uh, especially inner city schools oftentimes um, is they're not coming from as wealthy of a community right. and your taxes go towards the schools. So even though, you know, they're supposed to be equal and so forth, they're just not going to bring in the same tax revenue. Um, and then there's a higher percentage oftentimes of single parent families and, and maybe the parents are working and don't have the opportunity to get involved and, and volunteer at the school, whereas uh, another community out in the countryside might have a lot more involvement and, and so on and so forth. So those are just a couple of things that just jump out right away. Um, what about specifically, um, you know, what's taught in the schools and, and how do we do a better job of um, showing maybe the true history of what's happened in our country and uh, uh, do you have thoughts on that part? I, th I think I think it's important for 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 people to to understand the past if if it if is a way to promote a young person uh, in the future I think it's it, I think it's important to to understand uh, the, the the history of certain aspects of social unrest I think it's really important to understand the the true dynamics around slavery and, and how slavery was uh, was uh, you know slavery was an issue in in the Western world not only the United States but uh, but I think that there are there there are different uh, ways that we need to look at that, and um, you know, and we we need to, and, and whoever whoever develops the curriculum, you know, has got to come up with different ways that we can really examine the history. And I, the other thing, Dan, is that we need we need to have our we, we there's got to be and you know maybe maybe it's coaches and maybe it's the teachers, maybe it's parents. We've got to um, we've got to make sure that kids, you know, an education an educated person is is a person who has the ability to go out and study things for themselves. And make sure that you know we we have you know lists that, that kids can really um, read from and learn from to to ensure you know even on their own that they're they're getting information about these subjects. But but the, the if if it if it's um, you know I I would hate to I would hate to put stuff out there that divides us. If 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 you know people learn about slavery and people learn about that history, the thing is how can how can we learn from those challenges and how can we move it forward in terms of our mindset. You know, and I, I think sometimes there, there's the threat that, geez, I learn about this stuff and, and the world has always been against me. And, and to be honest with you, I think that this country um, up until the, uh, you know, as, even as we're going through this pandemic uh, situation, there, 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 there are opportunities available that, that, that young people can take advantage of um, to, to, to create wealth and to create the, the life of their dreams if they pursue it, but we, we've got to get beyond the mindset that, uh, that, that a certain group is holding us back. Uh, if that's, if that's your mentality. Okay. Um, do you have anybody that has been really impactful in your life, uh, a mentor perchance, uh, uh, that has helped you along the way? Oh, gee, I mean, uh, so many of them. Um, you know, I think about uh, my my baseball coach at O'Day, the, the late Ed Hensley, uh, just was a wonderful man. Uh, he, he made w one of the most important uh, conversations and decisions. He, he I, uh, Dan, when ESPN first started, I, I thought it was my go my job to watch ESPN all day. <laughs> um, back in the, the early 80s, uh, you know, I think I set a record. I think I watched every single hour that ESPN first put on television and uh, certainly impacted my grades. I remember leaving uh, uh, the school at, at 220 and getting, getting the bus, getting home and propping up a uh, peanut butter jelly sandwich and, and, and watching sports all night and just thought it was the greatest thing. And um, Mr. Hensley told, had a conversation with me and he said, you know, why are you struggling? I said, well, he goes, what do you do at home? I said, I'm watching ESPN. He said, why you're going to have to turn off the TV? And, um, you know, we made a commitment to doing that. And, and uh, my grades got better, surprisingly. And, uh, you know, I was able to be eligible for, for uh, baseball and, and uh, made sure that I was out there. So he, he was a huge uh, influence. Um, Ed Crafton, the, the late Ed Crafton, who was a football coach at O'Day, th those guys were, were tough men. And, um, you know, they, they, uh, they yelled and screamed a little bit, but, uh, you know, sometimes you, you need to have uh, your, your, your tail kicked a little bit. And, um, and certainly he wasn't afraid to do that. And, you know, I, I think that brought a sense of uh, discipline there. Uh, Jerry Schaefer, who was a longtime educator, uh, I think he's retired now from the, uh, from the Bellevue Public Schools, but he was at O'Day. And once again, a guy who had very, very high standards and he was very, very tough. And um, he didn't allow cliff notes in, in our English classes and you had to come in and you better be prepared and a Socratic method, he, he would call on anybody and you couldn't fake it. And if you didn't do the reading assignments and if you didn't do the English assignments before the class, um, you know, you were, you were, you know, you were kind of stoned and he, uh, 
he, he really, he would call on you and he would expect you to know the answers. And if you didn't, you know, you, you had better prepare when you came into that class. And that, that really helped me become a, a much better student. Um, my, my Western Oregon, well, was a Bill, Bill Hain, who was the, the, the head baseball coach at Green River Community College. And he's now currently out uh, in Idaho and has a beautiful family out there. And he and I communicate regularly on Facebook. Bill was a tremendous, you know, typical, typical community college coach who put his entire life into coaching that team and, and providing that experience for us. And I have so much respect for the community college coaches and, and at our state colleges, our state college systems and, and the work that they do in, and uh, playing in front of nobody and uh, just doing it for the love of the game. And, and he was just tremendous back then and uh, had, had uh, really high academic standards and, and really allowed us to get involved in the administration at, at Green River and just did a great job of, of building the academic experience into that athletic experience. Um, my, my, my coaches down at Western Oregon, Joe Caligiuri, who was the, the longtime baseball coach, I was, I was it was a joke that I was a part of his uh, 300th win and 400th loss, <laughs> and uh, he was a, just you know an, another uh, you know incredible influence and uh, and uh, you know small college baseball and, and providing that opportunity and, and being so committed to it and and, and building a you know really teaching us how to build a team and he was tough on us which I really appreciated. Uh, Dr. Jack Rye, the athletic director at um, Western Oregon, and I, I tell the story. I was I got an internship with the Chicago Cubs in my senior year and was leaving for Chicago, um, and they had, a, they, they had a goodbye party for me. And I had no money in my pocket. I was going to Chicago with nothing. And I, I went to, after the lunch, I went to the restroom and um, was, was literally using the bathroom. And Jack came up to me, and he was kind of, a, kind of an Oregon cowboy type and uh, would regularly wear bolo ties and everything. But he, he came up to me and just right next to me in the stall, and he hands me $300. And he says, I know you don't need this, but, you know, you could probably use it when you're in Chicago and uh, you um, you can give it back to me whenever you can. Mm -hmm. And and uh, Dan, I mean, I, uh, I almost started crying mm -hmm. because I guess I, you know, that, that money paid for my rent and gave me <laughs> gave me a foundation to kind of get started back there. And um, he, he was so, so wonderful to me. And then I, I, I remember uh, nine months later, I came back to school with a box of um, baseballs from Henry Aaron. Mm -hmm. And I was working with the Atlanta Braves. So about this is about eighteen months later, and I came back and I, I gave him um I gave him three hundred dollars in the box of I you know I gave him three hundred thirty dollars in a box of baseballs. Wow. And he 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 said to me, there was no interest. He goes, take the thirty dollars back. There was no interest on the money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that was that was just a just a real special guy. Um, and then uh, you know Bill Fletcher, who was my American Legion baseball coach, mm -hmm. wonderful African American man, and just loved the game of baseball, and, and just really taught me so much about the game. And um, you know, I, I, there was there was a period of my, my late teens where I just wasn't having fun. It was just kind of a grind for me. Mm -hmm. And Bill told me, you know, you you got to just loosen up. You got to have fun doing this. Yeah. You got to have fun doing this. And you, you don't 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 worry about trying to make the major leagues and don't worry about all this pressure. Just enjoy playing the game. And that's really when my my college career took off when I started having fun again mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, uh, and ended up getting the scholarship to Western Oregon, but he was, he was tremendous. Um, and, and just, you know, so many, so many folks uh, that, that I could, I could share. Uh, Chuck Armstrong, who was the, um, the president of the Seattle Mariners. I was, I was student body president of Western Oregon and um, just the night of Al Campanis. So I remember you might be too young to remember this, but Al Campanis on Nightline, uh, uh, Ted Koppel interviewed him uh, on the, 40th anniversary of Jackie Robinson. It was back in 1987. And um, Al Campana said some very unfortunate things that were really the underlying pro crux to why you know, we, we, we hadn't seen a lot of black people working in the front office or as managers in Major League Baseball. And he said that black, blacks lacked the necessity to swim and they, they lacked certain, certain uh, characteristics. Mm -hmm. And Ted Koppel gave him a rope to save himself and Mr. Campanis couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked watching that. And uh, I, so I sent a letter to Chuck Armstrong. I just wrote a letter on my Western Oregon. You know, I'm the student body president here and I can, I can swim. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Campanis said that, um, that blacks lack the, the buoyancy to swim. And I said, you know, I grew up in Seattle. I can swim like a fish. And I, you know, I had all these different adjectives in there. And Chuck Armstrong called me back. Mm -hmm. And um, he called me and I was so nervous when I picked up the phone, I dropped the phone and I hung up on him. Oh my. <laughs> 
Yeah. And so I, I ended up, I, he ended up calling back and we had a wonderful conversation and developed a relationship. And he was so, so influential and supportive in my career. And I, I ended up working for the Seattle Mariners in a, in a, in a marketing and sales capacity. But, um, you know, Chuck was an incredibly uh, uh, a great, uh, great man. And, and, and I always appreciated that follow up. And and you know and just and, and then you just I mean just so so many so many uh Gary Locke is still a tremendous influence and and I I don't, I don't you know I, I don't tend to want to get into politics and mm -hmm. I know that can always be a tough situation for folks but Gary Locke is a tremendous individual and um, he's incredibly loyal and he's been very influential and has always supported me outside of my career and I've always appreciated that and someone who really understands the value of friendship and hasn't forgotten. Um, and sometimes politicians do, but but uh, he he certainly hasn't forgotten the work that that uh, we did together, and has always really been able to help me and support me. So it's a really cool relationship there too. Awesome. So without having you jump too far down that rabbit hole, it is uh, the first Tuesday in July or <laughs> August, excuse me, and uh, it is primary election day. Would you just mm -hmm. touch on the importance of the elective process? Uh, I, I mean, it's it, to, to to me, it's it's such a, a critical process. First of all. I'm having, I, I ran for the state legislature in 1998 and, and lost narrowly um, here in the, the Southeast Seattle district. But yeah, I, I just think that the, the, the people, no matter what side of the, the political spectrum they're on. I, I just, I, I always think about the people who, who step up and spend their entire summers running for office. So I think about all, all of these, these, these men and women and, uh, and young and old and, 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 you know, some of them, uh, you know, have overcome tremendous odds. Some of them have been incredibly successful and some of them have personal philosophies and this is how they've chosen to do it. So I, I hope that they have all had great summers. And I, and I hope all of them come out of it with, with the experience that they can take and, and lead, whether they are successful or not. And, I, and, and most importantly, I hope they all come out of it with no campaign debt, mm -hmm. because that, that certainly was a big part for me. I ran two campaigns and, and came out with no debt, and that's huge. So I hope they're, they're able to do that. But it, it takes such a tremendous sacrifice. So I want to say, I want to give a shout out to the people, all of them who are running this summer for those offices. Um, and yeah, I, I just think that it's, it is such a, you know, our, our, our government, and I, and I think, and I, I firmly believe in the, 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 the foundation of America and the way it was presented by those, um, you know, in, incredibly wise leaders uh, in, back in the, back in the 1700s that, that really built the foundation. And yeah, I, yeah there's, there's some flaws to it. And, and we're a very young country and there's some flaws that we're, we're still working out. So they, I recognize that. And, and certainly in the last couple of months, we've seen some of those flaws. But Dan, um, it, it is a, it's, it's, a, it's a marvelous country. When you run for office, you get to meet remarkable people and you hear so many different stories. And, and, um, and, uh, and I hope that people take the efforts of the people who are running seriously. And, and I hope that people take the time to, uh, and in this state, I think it's great that we do have mail-in voting. And I, I, I understand that, you know, the, 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 the issue and the debate around there. And I certainly respect the fact that, um, that, that, that you know, there, there's an opportunity for, for different things to occur. But the bottom line issue is it gives more people an opportunity to vote. And I think most people who, who, um, who, who are, uh, of the mindset that they want to make a difference in their country and, and they want to have a, a say in who's elected, uh, they, they will they will take that ballot and they will put it in the mail with, with their votes on there and then they can do it with great conscience that they're making a difference that's positive for our community. Awesome. My 18-year-old uh, daughter, just today's her first day that she can vote and, and uh, she's participating, so I'm proud of her. Um, I, I'm proud of her too. Congratulations. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, last two things. What mm -hmm. gives you the greatest hope for our country moving forward, specifically, you know, thinking about racial relations, but you can touch on other things. And then the last thing is anything else that you want to say, I'll give you the final word. Um, I, I, Dan, I, I grew up with uh, two brothers, my brother, Andy, who was a year younger than me, were Irish twins. And uh, Jose, who uh, Andy, Andy went to Rainier Beach High School. Jose went to, uh, to West Seattle High School. And, um, it, and I, you know, growing up with brothers, man, uh, you fight, love each other, but you fight. And, and we, we fought and we, we fought over dinner. We fought over a variety of different things. And, uh, you know, and, but the thing is we still love each other. And, uh, and ultimately what happens when you grow and mature, 
And I was showing this to my, my son Clemente, who's 12, you know, he, and he and his sister fight right now. But I said, your, your best friend, uh, no matter who, who your best friends in school and who your best friends socially are, you, you know from experience, now my, my two best friends are my brothers. And, and I think that, uh, you know, going back to the situation in the last couple of months, Dan, I, I think it's okay for, for our country to, 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 to stand up and to, to, have some, to have some intense dialogue. I think it's okay for our country to, to, to have these types of conversations. I think it's okay for us to fight. I think it's okay for us to, to share our differences. And, and I, I have wonderful friends who are conservative, who are Republican. I have incredible uh, uh, leadings and friends who are, are very, very liberal and, and Democrat. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have dip differences in our country. And, and I think it's important now, and at least, at least over the last couple of months, we're having different ways that we can communicate about these things. Uh, sometimes it's been, and I think most often it's been in a positive manner. Um, it, it, the, the, the protests in, in, in many parts of the country, notwithstanding, that they, I mean, those, no, one, no one wants to see that type of fighting. Mm -hmm. but, um, but the bottom line issue is at least we're having some intense dialogue. And I think through intense dialogue, uh, it, you, you, you end up getting uh, the, the type of conversation that will allow for some sort of progress. And I think when things start to settle down in the next couple of months and people continue to have conversations, whether it's at the dinner table, whether it's at the bar, um, you know, the, 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 whether it's at uh, the ball game, when we start going to ball games again, um, you know, at, at least we'll be able to come a little bit closer and people will, will be able to have those types of conversations. Um, I, if, if there's anything I wanted to add today um, to the conversation, uh, you know, I felt that uh, the, the training that we received from Pete Carroll um, was remarkable back then. And, I, you know, I, I remember he asked us to put together a mission statement um, and, you know, he, he was asking people around the room, you know, what's your mission statement? What's your mission statement? And we didn't have an answer. And I believe that was back in 2010, 11. He said that, you know, I remember thinking to myself, I remember Pete Carroll saying, well, you guys, you guys aren't doing well enough. You guys aren't doing well enough. And uh, he was absolutely right. And, uh, you know, I, I have a mission statement enthusiastically helping people, uh, uh, emphasizing uh, preparation competition with the with the the goal to uh, help and serve and support each other and I think that we have got to you know as particularly as coaches and as people in the community it's important to have your your, your personal foundation right um, and like I said you know if if you're not working on yourself if you're not working on yourself people can see right through it so you've constantly got to to be working on yourself and looking at different ways that you can you can pull these types of, of philosophies and different things together and, and to, to, to pull your family and to pull yourself together and, and really uh, to, to make that, that type of um, self-improvement and, and self-actualization and continually work on that. Um, I, I want to also say that um, I had a fascinating conversation with Tyrone Willingham, and I know that's a name that Boy, it engenders different feelings here in the state of Washington, and uh, you know, um, and it, and he, I think he he accepted that because you know he, he didn't win football games, but um, he and I had a conversation one one night about number one about work, and and he, he talked about the fact that you have got to love your work, and and how important the value of work is, and another thing he told me too was that um, you know as as a, as a coach he said one you know when you're applying for these head coaching jobs remember they're they're not looking at you as a football coach and they're not looking at you as a person who knows the the air raid offense or the or or the spread offense or the i formation or the or the 4 3 under defense they they're, they're not looking at you for that when they're looking at you in these interviews they want to know is this the man that I want raising my children and I, I thought it was such an important question, and and I took that back. That was that was one of the things I really took back, and uh, and and you know you, you referenced that you had a daughter, and um, you know the the the, the conversation is is this is this the kind of man that I want my daughter to marry? But now now having a daughter, you know it it really is a, it, you know it's almost a, a more important conversation than that. You know is this is this the kind of young man that I want as a part of my family? And, uh, and, and I think it's okay. I think it's a necessary standard that we have as, as fathers. So, um, you know, I've always tried to work at that level, you know, in terms of what I'm trying to present and what I'm trying to promote. And I thought that, uh, you know, Coach Willingham had a really, really good impact. And, and I think that's something as, as we as coaches that we got to think about cre creating that type of environment where we're creating great people. That's awesome. Um, <clears throat> That reminds me very much of a, a quote that I actually just posted on Twitter and Facebook, and I think you saw it, uh, from Dabo Sweeney. He said, you can win, 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 but if you're not equipping young men to be great husbands and fathers, you lose. 
you know. So, I saw that. Yeah. My, my, my wife just yelled over here, hey, man, she's, she's uh, listening to a little bit of the conversation. And uh, Dabo, Dabo Sweeney's got that right. And uh, obviously, obviously, college football right now is going through some challenges. And I hope that the athletic directors and I hope that the coaches are, are making a great decision. And you and I both know the constraints that they are under in terms of the pressures uh, and, and the, the, the tremendous pressure that they have to, to provide a product for, for, for college football this year. But I hope in that conversation, and I believe they do, they, they're looking at making sure that uh, this is a safe environment for the kids who are participating and, and making sure that they have uh, that we, we protect the integrity of that environment so our kids that are out there on the field will, will be safe and, um, and that they'll be able to, uh, to make good decisions surrounding this. Amen. Juan, it's a, a pleasure and it's been great reconnecting with you in the, in the last few days here. Dan, thanks so much. I appreciate the time and I just appreciate what you're doing. God bless you. You as well. Thank you.